Social media has played a major role in what some are deeming a new type of Great Depression, specifically amongst the first generation to grow up with these platforms entirely. We don't fully understand what's going on, nor have we had the time to really dissect it, but already we're moving into the next level of it all. So today we're going to reflect on the current and near future state of social media, mostly in regards to Mark Zuckerberg because we have the most intel on Meta's positioning and he's been doing a lot of interviews lately. But we'll still discuss all the big players in the next gen hardware game right now. All right, so the sentiment around Zuckerberg over the past five years has been predominantly negative, whether that be because of Facebook's misinformation problem, issues regarding user privacy, claims of putting profit over users' well-being, censorship critiques, people thinking his bet on the metaverse is tanking, and in terms of broader cultural discourse, the dwindling user experience on his platforms. But simultaneously, the lizard sentiment has died down quite a bit over the past year and a half. Are the allegations true that you're secretly a lizard? Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to go with no on that. Uh, I, I am, I am not a lizard, um, but, you know, keep the high quality comments coming in. Please, this is, uh, surely on track to be, uh, a great live Q&A if we, if we continue getting stuff at, at that level of quality. He's been making independent media appearances for the first time, and he's been posting far more on his personal platforms than ever before. And while you see some then move towards idolization, on the other hand, despite his company's power and possible role in shaping our trajectory as humans, you see some people just not willing to listen at all. Which, I don't know, I think both angles are pretty blinding. Zuckerberg has almost unfathomable responsibility, so personally, I can understand and accept certain realms of fuck-ups. Social media companies probably have the most nuanced responsibility of any companies in the world. They have a chokehold over culture, and there's no playbook. They're the first companies, and we're all the first humans experiencing these wild means of consumption and communication. But for the same reasons, we should stay on alert and not just be passive users. We recently saw a lack of this when TikTok CEO Shu Chu testified before Congress. Look, I'm not trying to be a rock. All the edits were objectively funny. American social companies don't have a good track record with data privacy and user security. Let me look at Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. <laughs> TikTok will remain a place for free expression and will not be manipulated by any government. Them LA boys, they wanna fuck, they wanna fuck. Them New York boys, they wanna fuck, they wanna fuck. Them oh my god, yes, I'm, yes, I'm that. I was really hoping that he will come through. I was reposting every single one, but still I can admit that those were getting into like some propaganda-esque territory. Okay, I know I'm not the only one that has absolutely fell in love with this man the past couple of days, but he is bringing a new standard to women's dating lives. The guy's representing a business with thousands of employees, millions of eyes, and billions of dollars to lose. The framing of his answers is at the least going to be self-censored by that weight. For example, We spent a lot of time adopting measures to protect teenagers. Many of those measures are firsts for the social media industry. We, for we forbid direct messaging for people under 16, and we have a 16-minute watch time by default for those under 18. TikTok implemented that capability just days before the hearing so they could have that framing in their back pocket because they knew youth well-being would come up because of the rising legislation proposals. Very calculated. But today, we're diving into two Zuckerberg media pieces that came out over the past week, and a question I want you all to ponder throughout this is, what do you think Zuckerberg's life philosophies are around extended realities? So that includes VR, AR, MR, and beyond. A lot of you are probably like, bitch, what do you mean life philosophies? It's about profit. And of course, that's a huge element. His platforms have reached a ceiling and he has to think about what's next and try to position them as a dominant force so they don't die. But also, we always move forward. I personally wouldn't want to live my sole existence in any previous time period instead. By using these platforms intentionally, I've been able to achieve more knowledge and fulfillment than would have ever been possible for me had I been the same age and had the same like education and general life experiences up until a certain point two or three decades ago without it. And thinking even further back with technology, you know, I'm not willing to give up cameras or airplanes or electricity or refrigerators or uh, air conditioning. Hell no. There's got to be potential pathways or outcomes where we adjust well to this relationship with tech and the future quality of life isn't shit or non-existent for the collective. I just saw this video on TikTok, and disclaimer, new contraption is meaning their first motion picture camera experience. And 
And the comments were interesting because people were like, this is not that long ago, but what a wild fucking difference. And also the tone of, look at the world now. Like, look what you guys left for us. And not in a rude way. I feel like a lot of people are like, look what you left for us. We're dying. But this was more so in a way of like, wow, we live in a pretty cool world. So what does a future outcome like that look like to Zuckerberg? What does he consider to be the North Star social dynamic in a decade or two? And if he believes it's one that has a balance between the digital world and the physical world, how is that going to be achieved, considering what we know now? Walking down a, a typical southern street prior to the air conditioning revolution, you, you would have seen families, individuals outside. They would have been on their porches, on each other's porches. Uh, there was a visiting tradition, a real sense of community. Well, I think all that changes with air conditioning. You, you walk down that same street and basically what you'll hear are not the voices of people talking on the porch, you'll hear the whir of the compressors. Online communities can be a wonderful thing, but they are still incapable of replacing physical communities because there are still so many That's things true. That's that true. you can That's only true. do with your, uh, in, 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 with your body. Mm -hmm. and with your physical friends. And with online communities, I mean, and, and they have done some really wonderful things for, 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 for people, but also they kind of um, don't give us the experience of, of, of doing these difficult but important yeah. things. Yeah, and, and I definitely don't mean to state that, um, that online communities can, can replace everything that a physical community did. Mm -hmm. the, the most meaningful online communities that we see are ones that span online and offline, that bring people together. Uh, maybe the, the original organization might be online, but, mm -hmm. um, but people are coming together um, physically because that's, that ultimately is really important for relationships and, and for, because I mean, we're physical beings, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, mm -hmm. are we trying to connect people so ultimately they will leave the screens and go and play football or pick up garbage? Or are we trying to keep them as long as possible on the screens? And there is yeah. a, 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 a conflict of interest there. Yeah. Of course, random shit is going to interject and change the trajectory. But still, this dialogue is essential to be having right now. From the heads of all big tech companies who, of course, are working on AI, but more so what we're focused on in this video, immersive hardware. Because we're not talking about little products in our home, you know, a vacuum. We're talking about products that shape humanity's identity. Our little devices, those little devices in our pockets, are so psychologically powerful that they don't only change what we do, they change who we are. Let's think about that more deeply because it is pretty fucking wild. We're at a point with tech where not only do I think people deserve, but I think people should demand as much information as possible about potential trajectories so that they can come to conclusions about how they want to proceed. Or else we're in a situation like Noam Chomsky has said generally about commercial advertising, where uninformed consumers are making irrational choices. There's huge efforts to try to create irrational consumers, uninformed consumers making irrational choices to undermine market economies yes. and to turn people into uh, people who believe, may even believe that what they want is to sit on a couch and watch television, but it's not what they want as yeah. human beings. It's not just about cute mission statements anymore. It's about whose cultural trajectory do you want to align the bulk of your existence with? Right now we're just getting fed like product specs. A few CEOs have made subtle hints regarding their broader point of view. It's important we design in a way that is built for the real world and doesn't take you away from it. Tim Cook is the latest CEO to question the metaverse. Is he? I feel like he's questioned the metaverse before. He's very anti-Zuck. Uh, while Meta funnels billions into CEO Mark Zuckerberg's pitch for the metaverse, Apple CEO Tim Cook thinks most people couldn't even define the metaverse, let alone spend long periods of time living their lives inside of it. The shade. But I don't think it's crazy for consumers to push that they want these things elaborated on and blatantly laid out. Extended realities are something to take lightly. And while many elements of AI are kind of waiting for a wave to hit and then reacting, we have more choice in our relationship with immersive hardware. For now. Because as they get ingrained in schools, work, and so on, a major element of that autonomy is taken away, like it has been with computers and smartphones. We know how addicted we are to accessing media on our phones, and it's anticipated that in a few years, 
VR is going to be next level. At least without regulation, is it really possible for someone to have a balanced relationship with something like that? It's almost like you're either all in or you're out, and it's going to be really fucking hard to walk back if you decide to be all in at one point. I'm super worried and concerned with uh, um, how out of touch it might make people and how it distances us even further. Mm. I think it, it, another movie, uh, Wally by, by Pixar, that's the future we're driving towards um, with everyone in the floating chairs, you know, drinking their food out of straws and, and uh, you know, constant 24 seven entertainment. And you can see that like the whole world is headed this way. And I, 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 I want to believe that there's a different answer. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I'm, it's, it's going to happen. I'm, I'm skeptical about um, some of the, the benefits, and I, I hope we have an honest conversation about some of the harms uh, around more and more social distancing. Former Google CEO Eric Schmidt and his co-authors said it well, we're likely about to see a break off in March. Some segments of society may go further, insisting on remaining physicalist rather than virtualist. Like the Amish and the Mennonites, some individuals may reject AI or immersive hardware entirely, planting themselves firmly in a world of faith and reason alone. But as AI becomes increasingly prevalent, disconnection will become an increasingly lonely journey. Indeed, even the possibility of disconnection may prove illusory. Did I say that right? As society becomes ever more digitized, and AI ever more integrated into governments and products, its reach may prove all but inescapable. That's the truth. And the truth of the matter is that we have an existential question. Do I want to compete and be part of that game? Because trust me, if I decide to, I'm ahead of many people, okay? Or do I want to actually preserve my humanity and say, look, I'm the, the classic old car, okay? If you like classic old cars, come and talk to me. Which one are you choosing? I'm a classic old car. Which one do you think I should choose? I think you're a machine. People are going to start contemplating how they want to live far more deeply. And to do so confidently, again, I think we need visual understandings of these companies' broader cultural visions. Outside of short-term use case demos, all that consumers currently have to refer to for what the future could be are dystopian films. People don't have any reference point for what to align with and work towards otherwise. Government should be like, here's a deadline for all big tech companies. You have to make a film that shows your cultural vision for the next decade or two. You all have to premiere it on the same day so that no one mooches off another's ideas and then consumers can engage or disengage with who they want accordingly. I'm kidding, but also not really. If you if you want to understand the future of any technology, just read science fiction. They're, they're actually the roadmap writers. And it's obvious that um, like Snow Crash, uh, this book from Neil Stevenson is going to happen for mm -hmm. one. Like, now that we've seen it in a movie, like people want to build it. The media we consume helps us come to conclusions about what's relevant and what's possible. In his interview with Tim Ferriss, Mark Zuckerberg revealed his personal reference points when building immersive hardwares and extended reality interfaces. There are some that are just classics around this, right? So yeah. I, mean, I think at this point, anyone who's interested in this space would read Ready Player One and Snow right. Crash. Snow Crash. I think Rainbow's End is one that is maybe not as commonly cited but I think is is maybe the augmented reality sort of equivalent of some of the, the seminal works that talk about virtual reality. One of the things that I think is pretty interesting about all of these is that they, they sort of posit that the, that the world is in some sort of dystopian state. And that, I think, is very different from, from kind of how, how I think about this. We'll play the rest of the statement later, I promise. But like he insinuated, the ratio of utopian to dystopian media is vast. It feels like zero to 100. One of my friends who does filmmaking said this. I wanted to make positive science fiction, and I swear I'm going to do that now. This was just a final. It's just so easy to make, uh, you know, evil science fiction. It's just too easy. Anyway. It's true. Pessimism is easy. Demise feels almost innate to people, especially when you consider life and struggle and then death as the possible end of our stories. It just kind of feels like this. I don't look at it that way, but, you know, demise, innate. People deem utopia as boring and unrealistic, which is true in a sense. There is always struggle in order to create balance in the world. It's like a law of the universe. But still, we at least need some net positive 
Petreros. There is solar punk, which is described as a literary slash artistic movement that envisions and works towards actualizing a sustainable future interconnected with nature and community. It's an extremely important angle to tap into. The only thing is it kind of disregards how social media will evolve and that is extremely necessary messaging. Like social media is going to persist to some degree. What's the design going to be? What will its functions and use cases be? I don't think people want to stay within their physical communities entirely. Like being interconnected with the world is definitely not a bad thing. It's really embraced and I don't see that changing. So though when thinking about net positive portrayals of social tech's future, they may still seem dystopian when first consuming them because we are heading towards a new realm of unnatural in comparison to our current human form. And again, that's uncomfortable. But I liked this moment from Stephen Bartlett. But let's not pretend it's the cure for loneliness. Not yet. Do, do you think it? Do you think it could? That that artificial love and artificial relationships. So, so or... if if I told you you have, uh, you cannot take your car somewhere, but there is an Uber. Or an, if you cannot take an Uber, you can take the tube. Or if you cannot take the tube, you have to walk. Okay, you can take a bike, or you you have to walk. The bike is a cure to walking. It's as simple as that. I am actually genuinely curious. Do you think it could take the place of human connection? For some of us, yes. For some of us, they will prefer that to human connection. Is that sad in any way? I mean... Is it just sad uh, because it feels sad? Look, look at where we are, Stephen. We are in the city of London. We've replaced nature with the walls and the tubes and the undergrounds and the overgrounds and the cars and the noise and the, of London. And we now think of this as natural. Is it sad because it feels like it should be sad? That's a valid question. Constant human to human connection, that's what we're programmed for. But could that evolve? Every past species has just been a stepping stone to the next. And in my opinion, it's only gotten better. Could that still be the case here, somewhere between the lines? The simulation will probably be able to understand some of these complicated biological processes like protein folding and more, but we're really far away from that. I think we are really far away from it, but I don't know what that means because really far might just be a few years once yeah, a true. giant breakthrough happens. But fast. my point is I, th I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think evolution and monkeying with the evolution is a part of evolution. I think it's a natural course of progression for the way the human curious mind works and its ability to manipulate things around it whether it's manipulate environments and structures to survive the elements or whether it's manipulating electricity and frequencies to send signals and videos through the sky, whatever the fuck it's doing, it's trying to always do a, a better version of that. And I think that that manipulating genetics is a part of evolution. I think it's just a natural part of evolution. We just think of it as something since we created it, if we create a thing and that thing changes biology, what have we done? We've played God and we've done. No, no, no. It's a part of the thing. It's like bees make beehives. Mm -hmm. We make technology. That's like part of what we're here to do. And one of the reasons why we're so hyper curious and also materialistic is that it, that is the best way to fuel technological innovation and that it's a natural thing. And then if we start monkey monkeying with our, our genetics, that's also a natural thing. Yeah. It's all built into the system. The same reason why fucking bats pollinate things. It's all built into the system. It's just some monkeying is harder to do than others. I yeah. think uh, like the biological one is tricky. Even genetic engineering is tricky for... For now, for now. Yeah, but like how long is it gonna be tricky for? I mean, back then when you were on that stupid wagon making your way across the country, ducking arrows, yeah. that was a stupid way to get to the other side of the country. But now you just get in a plane. And instead of taking months and you eat your kids in the fucking mountains because you've snowed in, instead of that, you, you land in California in three hours. Yeah, It's crazy. And complain about the Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah, you're bitching. <laughs> I can't even fucking watch a YouTube video up here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I yeah. mean, yeah. what what we're doing now with that stuff is inconceivable to people that made their way across this country in the 1800s. And I think what we're going to be able to do in the future, 200 years from now, is inconceivable to us. Probably even more so. I think that framing is strong, and I just want tech leaders to be more transparent about if that's the trajectory they're aligning with and not play this digital world, physical world dance in their messaging where it may not even make sense. Now, Tim Cook and Sundar Pichai have been pretty blunt about some moral tensions and animosity towards a virtual reality type of future, 
But Mark Zuckerberg over here is like, nah, let's go fucking balls to the walls. Why not? And that's what I'm really interested in. Again, is these differences in life philosophies. This is pretty obvious, you know, just like humanity, whatever. This I'm more confused about, and I just want him to elaborate. Someone, why is no one fucking asking him this? I am proud to announce that starting today, our company is now Meta. Our mission remains the same. It's still about bringing people together. Our apps and their brands, they're not changing either. And we are still the company that designs technology around people. Hey, are you coming? Yeah, just gotta find something to wear. All right, perfect. I watched this back for the first time the other day since it premiered. I'm like, this is pretty crazy. All right, on that note, the two things I saw last week that had me like, spit it out, dude. First was him on the Lex Freeman podcast referencing the rising loneliness rates of the past 15 years and how that motivates him to better connect people via his platforms. We'll watch the clip here shortly. But obviously, there's some tension there, considering the past 15 years perfectly aligns with the rise of social media. Second was Meta lowering the minimum age for Quest users from 13 years old to 10 years old, despite the Surgeon General, Senators, and many other professionals already expressing immense worry about how social technology is affecting kids. Let's start with this clip. I think that there's, there's certainly you know, needs for companionship that people have, you know, older people. Um, uh, and it's, I, I think most people probably don't have as many friends as they would like to have, right? If you look at, um, there's some interesting demographic studies around that, like the average person has the number of close friends that they have is um, fewer today than it was 15 years ago. And I mean, that gets to like, this is like the core thing that mm -hmm. that I think about in terms of you know building services that help connect people. So I think you'll get tools that help people connect with each other are, are going to be you know, the primary thing that we want to do. Um, so you can imagine you know AI assistants that you know just do a better job of reminding you when it's your friend's birthday and how you could celebrate them. Right? It's like right now we have like the little box in the corner of the website that tells you whose birthday it is and stuff like that. But it's um, but you know, at some level, you don't want just want to like send everyone a note that's the same note saying happy birthday with with an emoji, mm -hmm. right? So having something that's more of an, you know, a, a social assistant in that sense, and like that can, you know, update you on what's going on in their life and like how, how you can reach out to them effectively, um, help you be a better friend. I think that that's something that's super powerful too. Um, but yeah, beyond that, um, and there are all these different flavors of kind of personal AIs that I think could exist. So I think an assistant is sort of the the kind of simplest one to wrap your head around, but um I think a mentor or a life coach, um, you know, someone who can give you advice, um, who's maybe like a bit of a cheerleader who can help pick you up through all the challenges that that um you know inevitably you know we all go through on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And that there's probably, you know, some some role for something like that. And then, you know, all the way you can you can probably just go through a lot of the the different type of kind of functional relationships that people have in in their life, and you know I, I would I would bet that there will be companies out there that take a crack at at um at a lot of these things. I just don't believe he truly thinks this next phase is going to translate to better physical connections, which people consider to be a crucial part of the epitome of human connection, or that it will even create a better balance between the two, physical and digital. And he doesn't necessarily ever say that it will. But he has said this. I think that there are all these reasons why it is very valuable for people to be able to be present in another place, no matter what their, their situation is. I mean, I, I, I kind of laugh about this sometimes when I like, you know, my, my family has a, you know, we, we love going down to Kauai and it's beautiful there. And, you know, we'll, we'll be out there and I'll, I'll, I love surfing. I love doing a lot of stuff, but I also, you know, love being in, in VR when I'm, when I'm there too. So it's obviously that's not, you know, that's not some kind of dystopian thing. But I, I think that just if you look at like equalizing opportunity across the world, you don't have to be in some kind of dystopian situation to want to be present with another person who you care about or an opportunity that's better in another place. So that to me always struck me as a very interesting theme of that science fiction. But in terms of like exploring sociologically and technologically what's going to happen, I've always found it pretty fascinating. And that clip is real interesting because it's like, dude, 
you have a pretty fucking awesome physical world reality. And yet you still want to be in VR. At least you have that awesome physical world reality pool to provide you with some balance. Now think of the average person's experience. It has its own unique beauty. But yeah, a media reality that is aimed at basically being a teleportation device to provide people with more of these crazy fucking experiences that they can't easily access in the physical world. You think that's not going to get them hooked? Duh. Again, maybe that's not as dystopian as we innately react, but let's not pretend there's going to be balance. Let's just consider the past five years of digital technology in relation to social media. The rise of artificial intelligence. It is the epitome of hive mind connectivity. Its knowledge base feeds on everything across the internet. Simultaneously, AI-powered recommendation algorithms are hyper-personalized and are the epitome of delving further into the self. The middle ground is lost, and I'm unsure how the next level of technology in relation to social dynamics wouldn't just do so further. Here are five current dynamics I've noticed between social media and connection. By the way, I've already tweeted these and made a TikTok about them, but I think they are like that important to consider. So here we go. First, passively consuming friends' life updates on things like Instagram stories can make people assume they have a decent grasp or understanding of what their friends have been up to which creates a lot of great micro check-ins via DMs slash replies, but seems to decrease the prompting of more long-form check-ins, aka deeper connection. Second, and furthermore on that previous point when we think about preference, online life makes people accustomed to jam-packed variety in consumption and stimulus, which we've seen cause dwindling focus and patience. This can make us seem genuinely satisfied with just consuming those quick bits of people rather than committing time to them in real life. Third, Advanced recommendation algorithms and niche online communities can help you come across people you resonate with unlike ever before. But this can create a situation of not trying or caring to connect with people in the location you reside, aka those you can easily and consistently connect with in real life, which turns into isolation and further delving into the digital world. Four, for most users, it seems the connections made by recommendation algorithms are much more parasocial than they are mutual. Fifth, if you do make friends online, living in a major city makes it pretty nice because they're likely to roll through organically at some point, if not often. But if you make a lot of friends online and live in a location where that's not really the case, there's a missing connection that we as humans are wired for and not having that causes, you know, a weird inner energy. And elaborating on that point, living in a major city is expensive. And if you want to have a sufficient social life and navigate the city safely via Ubers or whatever it may be, that's crazy expensive as well. A small percent benefits, while a much larger percent moves towards isolation and media addiction. I'm actually going to add a six because I recently listened to Emma Chamberlain's podcast episode where she talked about her dopamine detox, and she said this. Day one, I woke up immediately despising the silence, okay? It was eerie to me. Prior to starting this detox, I was listening to something constantly when I was alone. Sometimes it was a YouTube video, sometimes it was a podcast, sometimes it was music. Regardless, I was constantly listening to something from the time that I woke up to the time that I went to sleep. And immediately in the morning of day one, I realized how bad that problem had become because being alone in a silent house was weird for me. I immediately regretted making it a rule that I wouldn't listen to music. But deep down, I knew that I needed to do this. I needed to be comfortable in complete silence again because I would consider myself to be an independent person. You know, I'm totally happy hanging out alone. I love it. I need it. But the truth is, I'm good at being alone when I have music playing or when I have a podcast going or when I have a YouTube video going. Like, am I truly independent? If I can't be truly comfortable in silence by myself. That's an interesting point. It's like, is the rising individualism all a paradox? And again, all these things initially sound bad. They sound sad. And I'm not saying that they aren't. There's a fucking mental health crisis on our hands and there's no way that social media doesn't play a significant role. But if I force myself to think about the positives, and again, this is from a niche personal point of view, and I think about who I've been able to connect with and learn from because of the internet, and I consider, you know, interest, values, wavelengths, whatever. And I compare that to my high school and college social life that was much more consistently physical world connections. 
But my visceral reaction is, I don't give a fuck. I want to go back to that. First of all, just in life principle, like move forward. But specifically in this case, the relationships I've made through the internet have just been that much more well aligned, which is also due to social media being the ultimate expression tool and allowing us to easily create a more holistic portfolio of our identities for others to just observe and opt into without much social pressure, which is crazy amounts different than a world of simply in-person, face-to-face social interactions. And like, like in middle school and high school, yes, I had social media, but I was by no means posting as freely and I didn't really approach it like a portfolio as much. And I always felt like I couldn't express myself right from mind to mouth, like to some degree, but there's a big percent loss and there's just like a whole visual element and social media lets you easily lay it out and not have to explain yourself to people. It's just like, that I am. You either get it or you don't. Bye. I just feel like social media is very, like, socially efficient. If someone else posts online a lot and I am able to look through their profile, I can figure out if I think we should hang out more or be friends. In the past when it's just, yeah, in-person interactions, it's like, it takes a long time and it's like a lot of wasted time to realize you don't fuck with someone, so no thanks. Maybe that's a fucked up point of view, but that's my opinion. But do I wish there was more physical world interaction with the people I connect with online? For sure. It's just the difference in quality of mind is high enough that I'm willing to not be too caught up over that downside. For now, give me a year or two. We'll check back on that. But I'm trying to play devil's advocate and make us think bigger. Back to those six things though, Consider the next iteration of social tech. Something like AI companions, whether it be a chatbot or an extended realities, they encompass extremes even deeper, as they simultaneously access the hive mind and aim to be a mirror of your desires in a way that personally interacts with you, which gets really compelling and is dopamine central in terms of giving you what you want. So it's just like if deep down Zuckerberg thinks that individual to individual human connection genuinely doesn't need to be as important as it once was, just be straight up about it and lay out the bigger vision. But while in marketing videos, people are connecting with their long distance relatives. I think that's just for cross-generational appeal. The underlying framing is definitely to better connect you with your internet friends and to create some sense of presence. Again, like teleportation, because that is the big void right now. But also again, when we think about how a lot of people, if not the vast majority, give a lot of their time to parasocial relationships rather than potential mutual online connections, that's still very much going to persist. About to see reality subscriptions instead of reality shows. All right, that's my reflection on that. Lastly, the quest minimum age being lowered from 13 to 10. The Verge broke information about this in tandem with Meta posting a blog about it. Prior to this, Meta's website stated, Meta VR systems are not toys and must not be used by children under 13. Younger children have greater risks of injury and adverse effects than older users. While we know that children under 13 may want to use meta VR systems, we do not permit them to create accounts or use meta VR systems. Never mind, I guess, brick a leg and a brain cell. Still, those under 13 years old won't be able to access Horizon Worlds, which is meta's social VR platform. So this change is more about just general access to the hardware. And instead of defying the age recommendations and using an adult's account to access everything, kids can use a preteen account with a safer, more shielded experience. And of course, Meta is pushing the education angle for wholesomeness. But what's interesting about Horizon Worlds is Meta also just lowered the age for that a few weeks ago. It was originally for those 18 plus, but now they're going the social media route and allowing it to be 13 plus. Rightfully, senators are not too happy about this, but look, it's 3 a.m. I could talk about it for hours. I'll, I'll save you. I'll spare you. Um, I don't want to get too far into it right now, but I will leave you with this. I got this suggestion from Reddit last year. Usually my phone is my reason for procrastination and low grades, etc. And I want to beat my addiction this summer, but the problem is I have literally nothing to do without my phone when I have no homework or anything. I could be on the computer or TV instead, but then it would be pointless because I would waste the same amount of time. Probably your advice would be to find a hobby, but I do not have any skills other than programming. I cannot do that while being screen addiction. So any advice is appreciated. Thanks in advance. Modern hobbies and work being at tension with screen addiction is so fucking real. But solitude, focus, and dedication are tough to embrace today. We have an abundance of distractions and they are only becoming more compelling. And it's an especially weird precedent to set for kids today because they aren't gonna have a reference point for otherwise. When we don't have the capacity for solitude, we turn to other people in order to feel less anxious or in order to feel alive. 
When this happens, we're not able to appreciate who they are. It's as though we're using them as spare parts to support our fragile sense of self. We slip into thinking that always being connected is going to make us feel less alone, but we're at risk because actually it's the opposite that's true. If we're not able to be alone, we're going to be more lonely. And if we don't teach our children to be alone, they're only going to know how to be lonely. At least for the older half of Gen Z, yes, we had access to the internet throughout our entire time growing up. We had phones pretty early. We talked to strangers online, very young, too young. But the culture around social media was a bit different in our preteen and early teen years. It was a little less advanced. We also didn't have an iPad thrown in our faces, little kids, at least to like the same degree. And we still had to flex those muscles of making something out of nothing in order to be entertained sometimes. There's definitely an important duality there in terms of grounding and understanding. Because yes, my social media experience was a huge part of how my identity evolved. It was crucial, it was important, it was net positive for me. But still, today, having those reference points of pure boredom when I was a kid actually still benefits me a lot. It's like, oh yeah, this feeling is okay. It's, it's normal. It's actually really good for you. Sit in it for a bit. And as Nikola Tesla once said, the mind is sharper and keener in seclusion and uninterrupted solitude. Originality thrives in seclusion, free of outside influences, being upon us to cripple the creative mind. Be alone. That is the secret of invention. Be alone. That is when ideas are born. Will humanity being completely media-brained end up beneficial? We shall see. I did not do this last topic justice. I have so many ideas around cognitive and identity development, but those will be coming soon. It'll be great. I'll keep my sanity for now. Thank you so much for being here. See you next time.